Hi, and welcome to our Marketing Reboot LinkedIn Live and Stop the Sales Drop podcast. As a quick reminder, you can find all of our LinkedIn Live videos and podcasts at stopthesalesdrop.com. And if you go to stopthesalesdrop.com backslash Friday Reboot, you'll get a special link to all of our interviews and panels to your calendar so you don't miss the information you need to rebound. I'm your host, Christina Jaramillo, and today with me is my partner, Eric Gruber, and more importantly, Deanna Ransom, Global Head of Marketing for Televerde. So we have an amazing topic that I can't wait to dive into. But first, Deanna, can you tell everyone and in our audience a little bit about you and your background? Absolutely. So my name is Deanna Ransom, as Christine said. I'm currently at Televerde um, as a Global Head of Marketing Marketing Services. I also sit as the standing chair for diversity and inclusion for the organization as well. Uh, my background is primarily in technology. I've spent time uh, in both sales, marketing, and doing some operational components at varying organizations that you may be familiar with, such as uh, SAP, Information Builders, uh, QAD. Uh, and then I did a stint in pharma at Merck as well. Uh, more recently, Clarivate Analytics. But I've also been a three-time customer of Televerde before I joined their team officially. So there you have it. Seems that you like what they have to offer. And it's interesting how that comes full circle, right? <laughs> Absolutely. You know, if, if you know anything about Televerde, you start to understand not only do they produce the amazing results that are needed. See, I can put my customer hat on and say that, right? My former customer hat, um, that they actually are able to produce um, on the marketing sales and customer success elements really able to streamline and align efforts and produce. But uh, we also are a company that's very focused on corporate social responsibility. So we have a very unique business model that allows us to um, transform lives and provide second chance hiring. And imagine being able to combine um, the best of both worlds in terms of business results with making a marked difference in someone's life. Yeah, not too many organizations can say that. And I, I think a lot of people are gonna learn something from that and hopefully follow Televerde's lead. Um, now, as we talked before, you grew up in marketing a little different than a lot of people that I've spoken with. You were accountable for revenue for a long time um, and continue to be. And I think that's something that's kind of rare today or at least where I've seen. So that's kind of why we're talking about rebooting the marketing organization so that marketing is accountable for revenue because it is totally a team sport. Um, and, and that's why we, we brought this topic on today. Yeah, I know Chrissy just said rare. I know we find a personal ABM. That's why we're excited on this. Because I can't tell you, Deanna, how many times marketing teams will be shocked when they come talk to us. And we say, our success metric is revenue. That's all we care about. <clears throat> We want to influence revenue through sales cycles. We want to impact um, margins. We want to be able to drive customer acquisition, but also retention and expansion, contract deal sizes. But that's what marketing should be influencing. At least that's what we believe. Otherwise, marketing is a cost. And, work, and costs get cut when there's times of uncertainty. What are your, I know you, always, as Chrissy mentioned, you've always been accountable for revenue, but where do you, how do you see it being so important that we make these shifts and become accountable? How important is that, do you think? Well, if I can answer the, the question very quickly that's on the table, how important is it? It's critically important, particularly um, to your point, my perspective is it shouldn't be just because of um, the current timing and urgency. I think that just becomes a factor. But I do believe that um, marketers have always needed to have a perspective of what is my contribution to this business, right? Beyond um, brand, because brand does have a contribution to the business and it does support revenue, but it's only a component, right? So then as you're thinking more about being able to track, measure, monitor, and optimize key things that lead to revenue creation, things like accelerating the deal cycle, things like being able to show not just marketing influence, but marketing sourced 
contribution to the pipeline, right? Because when I can look and show here are deals that marketing brought to the table, here are, here's how we were able to fast track those deals or get you into conversations that you otherwise may not have been able to get into. That's significantly important because now you can have a competent seat at the table within the C-suite and talk about the business metrics of EBITDA, talk about the business metrics of revenue. And that's where I think marketers need to put their effort and focus right now. I like what you just said about being focused on EBITDA. I think it's it's like you're earning your seat at the table when you're realizing that you know what you what your actions and what your strategy um, for the year or for the quarter uh, had actual influence. And so you you do earn that seat at the table, and people are going to start taking marketing more seriously. And I think that's that's what a lot of organizations need to do, and not just the big enterprise companies. I think mid market can learn from that as well. You know, I would agree, and I think some of being able to have that seat at the table and being able to really show yourself as a core business partner starts with being a partner. And what I mean by that is partnering across the organization for the greater good of the business. And that will mean reducing silos, being more transparent, having the right conversations, bringing stakeholders in, but still being able to have uh, clear roles and responsibilities and swim lanes. So it's not about creating chaos. It is about clarity. And I am a big fan of simplicity, clarity, and purpose. And that is where, you know, I've always tried to lead my teams and to direct our focus. Oh, no, I definitely like that, especially the purpose side, because I find that content, messaging, how sales is prospecting. There's a lack of purpose or intention between what we're, it's like we're just pushing out there versus I'm having a purpose. We're creating this content for this selling conversation. Here's what we want from this conversation. And this is how this piece of content is going to help that. So it was like, that's yeah. where I find a lot of missing is there is no purpose there. It's just pushing out. Hopefully it catches versus this is why we're creating this piece of an article, this article, this case study, this presentation. It's like, that's where I think it needs a lot more of. Well, you, you know, Eric, you're speaking to something near and dear to my heart. And that is not mistaking activity for productivity, <laughs> right? <laughs> so a lot of times, what you measure and what you monitor will be what you produce, right? If you are measuring and monitor, monitoring activity versus real metrics, the things that matter most, you're gonna be misaligned. You're not going to get to revenue. You're not going to get to scalability and optimization because you're gonna focus, like you said, on we need to create more of this. We need to create more of that. And getting to a point of clarity is asking very simple questions. Why? What do we want to get out of it? Have we used data to really determine and understand if it's going to produce in the way that we are thinking? In today's digital age, where there's more data being created, you know, even as we're sitting here, there was probably <laughs> how many more terabytes of data, right, created. Um, think about being able to use your data as a competitive differentiator to drive all of those motions. And then to your point, let's look at why we're doing something and what the expectation is. And we can clearly derive that and know that we're doing the right things to drive what we want to see. We don't want to just see more activity. I would like to see more opportunities, more deals, an accelerated close rate, leading to greater revenues, right? And ultimately healthy EBITDA. Love it, love it. Shaking my head over here. So, so let's, let's expand a little bit more on this uh, marketing being contributing to revenue or being responsible for revenue. How much do you think total revenue should be contributed or influenced by marketing? Yeah, so that's a 
great question because sometimes folks are like, well, we influence sales, but they don't want to look at the source contribution, right? And I think it's important that you do both, right? Um, if you think, I think of, I think of the process as an order of operations. So if you don't get the market and the marketing done properly, then your sales are going to be greatly impacted. They're going to be harder and the cost of sale is going to be more important, going to be more expensive. But if you do it as a proper um, order of operations, it becomes this machine, right? So you're talking about how much should marketing be on the hook for that? I do think that that is an internal conversation and an opportunity, if you will, to be that partner. Sit down with your sales leadership colleagues. Sit down with your customer success colleagues. Sit down at the, you know, the highest levels of the business and look at what your possibility is. And that starts by looking at your data. What's our TAM? How much of this do we want to capture? How do we want to go about that? Right. So those are really big strategic conversations, right? And then once you kind of map that out, you can say, looking at what we would like to do in terms of our growth, marketing, how much can you drive based off of, you know, your budget and then sales, how much can you drive, right? And you agree on that and you work together because at that point, it's a joint effort. It's not just marketing. Oh yeah, we're signing up for this much. It is, we're going to work together seamlessly as a team and we're going to split this in this manner, knowing that it's going to take us working in a unified effort. At some companies, I've seen it range between 20% to 40%. That's been um, the splits that I've seen at other, at different companies that I've intentionally served at. But, you know, is that right for your business? That's an opportunity for a conversation. Absolutely. I like how you said unified because a lot of times I find that organizations, if we even talk about account-based marketing, um, marketing is dealing with, here's the 500 accounts that we want to work with, or they have, it's like, where comes account-based awareness. And then sales is doing the one to few and the one to many, and it's sales job to try to make marketing's content relevant to those target accounts, but that's not where sales, they're good at their conversations, they're good at building those relationships, but they need that support, especially at the one to few and one to many. That's where I need more marketing support, I find, because that's where I'm going to shift the conversations. Well, I'm going to create the buying vision versus just react to predefined needs, which makes it a lot smaller deal. They need that extra support of here's my reframes, here's the stories to actually tell. This is what's happening. I, that's where I think marketing and sales should be working closer. You are so spot on. And I, I tend to look at, we don't use the word or I don't necessarily use the word support. I look at it as partnership, right? Because if marketing is on the hook, right, for um, booking and revenue, we don't close the business. So we need sales to actually close <laughs> what we're passing over, right? Just as much as they need our partnership, to your point, to have the right tools and assets to fuel their conversations, right, to build the relationships. So the more we start to um, look at each other across the aisle as partners, right, for the revenue creation of the business, you're smiling, Christina, did I say so? <laughs> no, I just, I don't understand why that people don't use that word. I don't understand why. We're all on the same team. At the end of the day, we want the business to be successful, right? You know, internally, if you were to ask anyone on my team or internally, I say, you, you'll hear me say this all the time. One team, one dream, right? <laughs> one does not win without the other. Yep. We're yep. all wearing the same jersey, right? If we're, you know, using that whole sports analogy, we're all wearing the same jersey. And, you know, the partnership agreement and the working motions have to be all towards accomplishing the final outcome, which is revenue. 
And so Eric, to your point, making sure that it is a partnership, it isn't marketing support and it is not sales support. It is the marketing and sales partnership interlock. And that's what you'll hear me refer to constantly. And that's yep. what I've always attempted to build in every organization that I've gone to because that's the sweet spot. Yep, I remember last time when we talked, you talked about it being a handshake, not a handoff like most sales and marketing organizations is, I bring you the lead and I hand off. No, it's a handshake because yeah, we need to be partnering to make sure that it actually leads to the close that we want. Exactly. So it sounds like I'm being consistent. With <laughs> so since, you, since we were talking about how some, some sales and marketing and even revenue generation um, departments work kind of in the silos or not maybe don't view it as a partnership, why do you think, Deanna, that there's such that disconnection be, or disconnect between sales, marketing, and revenue uh, generation? You know, I, I have a couple of thoughts around that. Um, it's tr There's tradition, right? The traditional, you know, sales is king because they're closing business and marketing, just give us the stuff we need. And some of that is legacy, yeah. right? So I think it has, um, and then marketing tended to be on the hook more for the MQL, right? creating the marketing qualified lead and to Eric's point, throwing that over and going, my job is done. <laughs> right? and, and so that immediately set up the age old finger pointing, which I absolutely um, detest between sales and marketing where these leads are not good. And, you know, sales isn't picking up my leads. And, and so no one is focused on what, we ought to be focused on, which is the growth and scalability of the business, right? Or everyone's trying to do it in their silo and be the, the hero as opposed to the team taking home the pennant, right? Teams take home pennants in team sports, right? Not individual players. Yeah. And so the more, I think that's a big part of it. And then, you know, the other piece of the disconnect is, you know, reframe. And what I mean by reframe is we need to reframe the conversation of marketing as a cost center. We need to reframe the conversation around marketing as a support function. And we need to recognize the core business partner and deliverability that marketing can and does provide. And you need to reframe all of that, reduce the silos, and be able to get on the same page to, for the business. Oh, I like that a lot. Yeah, I, I was just gonna expand on that. Um, so wh where do you think, do you think that marketing, like the leader in marketing and the leading leader in sales should be meeting? Cause I feel like that's not always happening like together to have a plan of action. So you bring up a, you bring up a very interesting point because you can have as many meetings as you like, but if true communication and partnership is not happening, it's still not fueling the outcome that you wanna see. So I do believe that there is um, a communication and a conversation with great regularity that has to happen here at Televerde. Um, and I will not toot our horns, but I will say, you know, we work at the partnership. We do look to understand with great respect, right? What each of the lines of business are bringing into the table so that we can have line of sight, transparency, know how we can use it, bring it into our conversations and workflows. So is the answer more meetings? No. Is the answer more respect and meaningful conversations and agreement? Yes. Absolutely, I, I agree. I think uh, some people think that maybe we'll meet at the beginning of the year what our goals are for that whole year, uh, sales and marketing, I'll meet once and we'll be done. And I feel like it needs to be like a check-in. Maybe it's a monthly thing, a quarterly thing, but it needs to be a check-in to make sure everyone's going, you know, do we re refocus? Do we need to re-strategize? Do we need to start from scratch? And I think that check-in is really, uh, important. So 
leading to my next question. How do we need to reboot the marketing organization so marketing can be and is accountable for revenue? So, uh, you know, if I can just speak from, from my chair, one of the things is, you know, marketers really, really owning that it is a business function, right? And that everything we do from brand, right, um, to customer retention ought to have a very clear KPI towards how it supports revenue creation for the business. Sometimes, if you think about something like um, advocacy and loyalty and the reduction of churn, you need to be able to substantiate that, right? And be able to say, we're, we're going to drive these things and then you'll have maybe other parts of the business that don't understand that'll say, oh, well, that's soft or squishy, <laughs> right? Brand is squishy, these things are squishy, but as a marketing business leader, it's on us to say, actually, it isn't squishy. Let me show you how this impacts our business. If we begin to churn our customers, it costs X amount of dollars to win a new customer, whereas we are able to save and scale by maintaining our customer base and reducing the churn, saving our business X amount of dollars. Now that's a business conversation, right? That's where um, I think the art science, and for marketers, I think it's art science and business. That's what we have to really own and speak to. The other thing that I, I don't like the owning, the other thing that I think it needs to happen, especially if we're going to have this partner, have a partnership, is that we need to align our processes with sales mm -hmm. conversations and processes. A lot of times, let's just say example, challenge a sale. This is something that we align with a lot at, at personal ABM. <clears throat> challenge of sales, all about tailoring for relevance teaching for differentiation. It's about making the reframe and making the emotional connection. But then most marketing content is not really about driving a reframe. I'm educating, I'm putting thought leadership out there, but what am I changing in the prospect's mind? Where are the stories sometimes in that article or white paper? It's a lot of times it's commercial. I mean, it's a lot of times it's insights, but not commercial. So it's not really something that sales can always use in their conversations. It's like, I'm trying to change their minds, but marketing is still here on, I'm giving education and insights, but it doesn't really support that selling conversation. So I think if I'm gonna have that partnership, we need to, and I'm not, we align with more with Challenger. It's what we work best with, but whatever the sales process, marketing needs to bring their process to, two together and see how we could support those sun conversations versus one's here and one's over there. I think that's a lot. So the ownership, but yeah, that partnership of how I can bring the processes together. And I think that's what's missing. Uh, you know, you, you speak to a great point, which is something that I think we're all learning a lot about this year, particularly, and that is empathy. And when you can you know, have a partnership conversation. So, you know, my background, I started off in sales. So I, I get it, right? And I know how much things change. So you need to keep understanding the sales cycle, the sales process, right? So that you can feed and support every stage of that cycle and process, right? Uh, so I, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and say that I think that, you know, that's a little bit of my background in terms of why I think it's so critical and having that conversation. But I do think that an empathetic conversation from both sides will allow everyone to better understand why it's not either or, it's why each of these elements are critically important for the full life cycle of the customer journey, right? The customer journey doesn't start at when they're talking to sales because we know that the data shows 62% of the sales cycle happens online before they ever speak to any sales representative at a company, right? So you do have to have your thought leadership and your insights and your education and those components 
out there. 62% of the journey starts there, right? But then you also need to bring it over the finish line. You do need to have, to your point, um, the case study. You need to be able to tell the story. And I would challenge most marketers to think of it as an end-to-end -end customer journey life cycle story and a conversation. And, you know, conversations change topics from time to time, right? So and that's where you can be fluid and agile, um, recognizing that, okay, from the audience identification piece, if we're starting here and we've gotten them through thought leadership and education, how are we going to be able to then help them make a decision in line with the sales process? That is huge. That's the piece that, you know, maybe I think marketing is growing into if I can be opportunistic uh, about it, um, because we certainly see that it is um, necessary, right? Absolutely necessary to be able to tell one story with one voice in all channels at every stage. So Deanna, just because you, you brought it up, uh, you talked about retention and expansion. How do you think marketing can be influencing revenue from existing customers? What, what could we possibly do that maybe we're not considering? From existing customers? I think that for us, what we look at is diving deep and partnering with our customer success colleagues. What's going on in that account? Um, how can we make sure that they're happy? Let's make sure we have a good cadence of conversation and communication with them. We also look to um, touch into what are their evolving needs, right? Because you can't just have the customer, oh yeah, they're our customer. Their needs are continuing to evolve. So you need to be able to stay connected to that. Um, we keep a pulse, if you will. So I think that marketing can drive that by um, satisfaction, right? regular cadence of communication. We have um, what we call our customer champion program, right? So that they stay tapped in. They recognize that this is community. You're not a client. We are your partner. And that means that the sale is not where we stop, <laughs> right? We continue to support and evolve with you and your needs and your business needs. And that's critical. And I think that's maybe an extension into the customer marketing piece that we focus on specifically here. But I think it's something that every organization can tap into more deeply by really looking at the customer as their partner and you know maintaining that relationship. It's like a marriage. You don't just get married and now you're done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I like how you talk about the evolving needs because a lot of times we find that customer success teams, account management teams, they are having the same type of conversation that you would have when you're acquiring a new customer. They just talk about the activities. Here is what would, in case of, instead of talking about what they would do, they're talking about, here's what we did do. Here's your benefits versus, here are the gaps that we filled for you. Here were your impacts. Having them acknowledge that, where they already saw the impacts that only you could fill, and then talk about, now here's how things have evolved. Here's what still needs to be changed to achieve these goals. Here's where we need to go. So now you can start driving that retention. We could drive expansion. You could have, because a lot of times customer success teams, they talk at the manager and director level versus creating that evolving conversation where we need to go to the VPs, the C levels that can get you an even bigger deal because they've already seen values. Like if we go here, this is what could happen. And that's where you start engaging with the higher levels. So I like that evolving because that's where it's not, it's not being missed. I think Corporate Visions even did a study on this and saying it's like 60% of customer success teams are having the same conversation as customer acquisition. There is no differentiation. Uh, that is incredible. Right. Um, and you're right. And, and for my chair, I think 
how, if you're thinking about how do we add value, right, for the client, to your point, being able to offer things like deeper insights, and what are some of the things that maybe you could be thinking about for your business that we've seen, right, bringing back that trend, um, trend insights based off of our engagement on behalf of the customer. Come, again, data as a competitive advantage, right? Being able to your point to um, raise the conversation um, to the next level stakeholder, because now you have everyone thinking about contribution and value to the customer and or the business. And I think that is a key thing that needs to be done. Looking beyond, did we check the box for um, the contract and going into a conversation that says, we've done this, here's a summative output of what that created, but here's what we learned and here's what's coming and how can we help you with this? Yep. You know, is that a conversation that you'd be interested in having? Right, that, that's a game changer, right? That's yep. a partnership conversation that you've been talking about as opposed to like a vendor or a provider, yeah that you change the conversation completely and then the relationship changes with that. But even so that uh, the content you were just talking about, we could be putting in more, that's what case studies miss. Here's, they miss that story. You get the solution. Here's a little bit about the kind, here's the challenge and here's a list of things that we did and then the results. They miss that story. Here's what we've learned. Here's what still needs those. That's the content that supports a higher level customer conversation. It really supports that partnership that we've, that we've been talking about. So that's where marketing can support that retention and expansion because you, now it's not just about the activities. It's those case studies and the stories that will reshape a different kind of customer conversation that is not being had today. The stories, you're, you're hitting a word that is something that has been near and dear to me for a long time. And that is the art of storytelling, right? Because we know that, you know, he who tells the story, right, <laughs> shapes the narrative. But it's telling the right story. And it's telling the story with the customer at the center. It's not, and, and I think that's something, Eric, that we need to call out. Um, from a marketing perspective, it is making the customer the central hero of the story and what we can enable them to accomplish, how we can support the growth of their business and what we've learned and, you know, what we can put in motion again for their success. And so it's telling the right story. And you're right. There, I mean, my goodness, case studies tend to be almost templated, <laughs> right? Almost templated um, in their approach. And they are not customized, if I can use that word, um, to the conversation that you're having with that customer, right? Maybe you can go back and do some value add, which is something that we do here. And we look across um, varying data elements to provide richer, deeper value learnings and potential next steps that a customer could take. And what, if they took those steps, what does it look like for their business, right? So now you're giving them some real business support in order to take a next step. I like that you're giving them the bigger picture and, and what the future opportunities for growth. And that's, that's again, the, the, um, the hallmark of a true partner. So any last uh, things, because we're wrapping up here. I know I'm going to ask Deanna one last question, actually, just to give her a, a takeaway, but anything from you, Eric? No, no, okay. I like what she has to share. And I want to <clears throat> leave it off on that because I want people to think about that, which <clears throat> So we're going to be discussing this further actually in an upcoming Friday reboot panel, which is going to include the CMO of Allocadia. And we're going to be talking about the shifts that uh, we should be making in marketing planning and measurement. So Deanna, I'm going to be reaching out to your team as I'd love for you to be part of that panel as well. So hopefully we can get you scheduled. Um, 
To learn more about our Friday reboot panels and get all of our upcoming LinkedIn lives and panel discussions on your calendar, please go to stopthesalesdrop.com backslash Friday reboot. Deanna, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. And before I let you go, can you provide our viewers, our listeners, our audience with key takeaways or a key takeaway uh, and how they can learn more about you and of course, Televerde? Absolutely. So if I were going to offer one key takeaway, it is, you know, from a marketing perspective, be a business contributor and be a partner across every facet of the business. It will serve your customers, your business, and you personally. So that would be my takeaway. Be willing to learn, grow, stretch by that partnership. And then, you know, to learn a little bit more about Televeria, which I absolutely hope you do. We are an amazing company, um, particularly because of the unique business model. And I have some great folks here that I work with. You can learn more at televerde.com. You know, visit us. You can also reach out to me on LinkedIn and I can point you to any additional resources if you need it. Thank you so much, Deanna, for your time. And thank you as well, Eric. Thank you, Eric. Thank, thank you. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.